Okay, and welcome to another episode of Unbridled Medicine TV, which is what I'm calling um, my channel. I had a conversation with a woman this week that wanted to sort of pick my brain about buying a retreat center. And so I had an idea after talking to her that I would do a bit of a, a YouTube video and a video talking about um, almost probably five years later, uh, a reflection point and... Um, what I would offer as any sort of insight for anybody else that's on the path of, you know, buying a retreat center or curious about that, because I've, I've learned a lot and having that conversation was really impactful for me just to articulate that. And I wanted to put it into this as well, because I do have people that will ask me over, you know, the course of the years of, you know, what is that process like? So, um, to start off for people who don't, maybe you're new to me or you're just finding me, um, about five years ago, or I should say four and a half years ago, um, I bought my dream property, which was an 80 acre uh, retreat center. It was operating as a dude ranch um, with a lodge and cabins and um, 80 acres so that I could have my horses. So I do a combination of things in my retreat center. It was always my dream to have land and a property. Um, I rescue horses and I also facilitate with horses as part of my coaching work. And then I run retreats and I offer, I also offer retreat rental um, for other people that are running retreats. And then I also do different types of accommodation rental out of my facility. But my dream was always to one day own a piece of property and to have a retreat center, I think before I even knew what a retreat center was. And so four and a half years ago, I sort of found myself um, face to face with this property that entered into my life, entered into my life very synchronistically, which that's a whole other story. And I, um, I went for it and somehow managed to pull it off and secure what I needed to purchase the property. And um, here I am four and a half years later. So um, one of the questions that I was asked is basically, you know, what's that process like? Would you do it again? Um, what did you learn? And things that I would tell anybody that's sort of in that process. And so to just kind of start off to know a little bit about me, if you don't know me yet, I am a dreamer, a really big dreamer. Um, I am, I would say a little bit of that kind of visionary. I have big dreams for my life. I would say sometimes I get a little fantastical about that and I can be a little bit naive about the realities of, you know, creating space for, um, you know, grounding my dreams into reality. And I don't always think of, you know, everything, but on the other hand, I also am a big believer that in life you have to really go for things. And so um, I think to start off sort of on this path of, buying this retreat center was first of all, um, it was very purposeful to me in terms of having a space where people could come and where I could hold my horses um, felt very much part of my purpose. And so one of the things that I shared with this woman is to really be thoughtful about what's the purpose of owning a property and having, whether it's a retreat center or um, a place where you want to host people, what's the purpose behind it? And the reason why I say that is because really having a clarification of our purpose and having that anchor is going to be really, really important. So for me, there was a really deep connection of, um, you know, first and foremost, I always wanted land because I wanted to have horses and I wanted to be able to give homes to horses. So there's a really big purposeful space for me in terms of having a property where I can do that. Um, I always was sort of attracted to having a place where people can come. I'm not a big traveler. I don't love to go to different places. So to be able to basically stay on my property and invite people into my space and to host them was something that felt very aligned and purposeful for me. Um, so there, there's a connection to what this place represents in terms of my purpose. I think that, you know, for this woman in particular, she wants to run retreats. There's a very different thing of wanting to run retreats and running to run a retreat center. Um, and I'll get to that in a second because um, we need to sort of know the distinction. So one of the things that I had offered to her was to really sit with what's the purpose behind you wanting a facility and where do you really connect with that? And does it have to be your own property? Um, I think as part of, you know, for people who know sort of my background, I talk a lot about um, what your medicine is and knowing your medicine. And I do believe that a piece of my medicine is having land. And so being able to sort of honor that, um, you know, application of my purpose or people can come and be on my land feels 
very important and sacred to what I hold space for. And so there is a deep resonance in that. Um, I obviously love where I live. I live on a mountaintop. Um, it's, it's beautiful, but there's also that sense of purpose there. So we need to sort of clarify the purpose behind it. Um, and, and the reason for that is, as I kind of get into the whole pieces around running a retreat center, it's a lot and um, it is not for the faint hearted, um, which I'm going to get to in a second. So the second piece of that that I sort of offered sort of wisdom on is definitely, um, again, I think that I try to balance out having the dreamer aspect and also the really grounded perspective of what does this actually look like in 3D reality. Um, and one of those being, what does it actually cost to run a facility? So owning a property and owning a retreat center means you are going to have a really high overhead. And I think that that is definitely something that we have to chew on and kind of wrap our heads around because I think, um, and, and for me, I started, I leased a property first. So I was sort of familiar um, about what it feels like to have really high expenses. Having a really high expense um, can be very stressful for people, including myself. Um, it definitely was an adjustment in terms of getting used to the fact that I have a massive overhead. And so for some people having that constant potential stress, and also you're, you have to give yourself time to grow into of having a very high expense and overhead um, is something that we want to consider, you know, when you, when you sort of are thinking about business plan and different things like that, you really sort of want to appreciate what you're stepping into. Um, I did to a certain extent, and I wasn't completely prepared for the magnitude of what this place is. I've adjusted to it. So for me, I've sort of acclimatized to the fact that I have to earn more because I have a high overhead. Having a high overhead running a facility means um, my money gets funneled in different places. And so we want to think about that. So um, one of the things that was really helpful for me was sitting down with the previous owner and really asking questions about what is hydro? You know, what are those little expenses that you don't think about? I'm not a detailed person, so I would not have it in my brain to think about, um, you know, what is the cost for that water every year? I'm on a, I'm on a septic system, so I have to get filtered water for my guests. Um, I have to pay um, a water tax every year. Uh, hydro, um, what are some types of other fees, you know, being part of VRBO or like there's a lot of different things, inventory in my lodge in terms of having, um, you know, the proper supplies, uh, having staff. My first probably six or eight months, I was on my own and it nearly killed me. Um, so I had to sort of factor in having paying somebody a full salary. And so there's that whole sort of mindset around being able for us to adapt and understand that when you own a property and you own a facility, um, you're going to have a high operating cost and expense. And there's always going to be potentially unexpected things that come up. My second winter, um, the water pump went down and that had to be replaced. And so it's a, it's a lot to consider, um, and that's going to really influence um, how you sort of plan or map out and think about how am I going to support this facility. So I think the finances are a big, big one. I will share, I was a little bit naive my first year. Um, I think what I also didn't appreciate was I, was I was taking on a whole other branch of my business. So when I bought this place, I had an online coaching practice. And then I was doing my equine retreats and training people to do what I do with horses. I really thought that adding a retreat center was no big deal. And it was a very big deal. And I didn't think that there would be a learning curve. I thought, oh, that's so easy. Um, people will just find me and I will, like my projections for my first year in terms of the clientele and bookings and my retreat center did not even come close to coming true because I really underestimated what it is to sort of grow a whole other branch to the business, especially entering into tourism, because having a retreat center, you are entering a different branch. And I, I wasn't really prepared for um, the stress of that. Also having people come onto my property and, you know, making sure everything was okay. And then being kind of at people's beck and call was a lot to kind of um, hold. And so 
I learned a lot my first year, first of all, that this was a much bigger undertaking than I appreciated. And like I spoke to this woman um, this week, you have to appreciate that if you're going to buy a retreat center, it's a whole separate business. And so you have to really appreciate that and to know anytime we're starting a new business, it's not going to pick up or be what we want it to be in the first year. You know, we have to build a reputation. People have to know about us. We have to find our systems that work. And that's a really big one. You have to know the proper staff. So I went through another big learning curve of what is the proper staff. I will say that um, people can be very attracted to what I've created here. And so I had a lot of people be like, I want to come work for you that were really enthusiastic, but didn't have experience. And that didn't turn out very well for me. So I had to learn that, you know, I need experienced people. And I think people also really glamorize having a retreat center. It's this very kind of glamorous idea and they don't really appreciate, you know, the, the, the work that goes into holding a space like that and making sure, you know, everything is clean and tidy and prepared for people. It's, it's a lot to sort of maintain and it's not always glamorous all the time. So I would say that, um, preparing yourself for knowing that this is a completely other side of a business that you're going to have to have a learning curve with, um, Probably hiring people to help you that have experience would be huge. I didn't get to that place till probably my second or third year, and that was really massive. Um, being prepared that there's going to be a lot of output of expenses before you match the turnaround. Um, what was worked for me was that I had other branches of my work, which I think is really important, having diversification in your business. But what was a detriment to me, so I will, I will be transparent, my coaching revenue went down my first two years because I was having to do so much more work um, at my retreat center and managing staff that it actually took away from my ability to be in my business. And I wasn't anticipating that either. Um, that just my, my time was not as much as I had anticipated I would have. And I, I kind of would mirror this. I don't have kids, but you know, when people have kids maybe for the first time and all of a sudden their time is not their own, that's sort of what it felt like, um, with my business. And so that was a big learning curve too. Um, I just didn't know these things. So I was, again, I think if I could go back, I would, or again, offer wisdom. I was super naive and I had, expectations that it was going to be a breeze and it was not a breeze. Um, I would say the first year almost killed me. Um, I think financially it was a big stress. I went back into debt, um, doing things on my own, learning how to manage my time, um, getting used to having people here and being part of the tourism industry and hospitality, um, going through different issues with staff. It was, it was a lot sort of packed in. So we want to anticipate that. So I think if I could go back, um, I might be able to anticipate things more just from a mental stand and emotional standpoint. And I could have adjusted to that. I've put the systems in place now where I can have that and I have the right help and I understand kind of the flow of this and how to support things, which has served me very well. Um, this is being recorded during COVID. So obviously my retreat business has been heavily impacted by that, but I have the right systems in place in my coaching business that I know how to adjust with that. So it doesn't feel like it's such a massive um, thing to go through because of, I learned so much in my first year. So I think having the an anticipation that it's not just the purchasing of a property, but it's also the cash flow and the expenses that are going to be an issue. Um, I applied for a startup loan. Um, I had private investors helping me with cash flow, but it wasn't, we were, we didn't anticipate that it was going to be as much as it was. So that was very hard emotionally, mentally. So I think, I think to save some of the emotional and mental anguish, you want to sort of know going into um, buying a, a retreat center, or any type of facility is you're going to have, that's going to be part of it. You know, I never really realized how big of a thing cash flow is um, until I bought this property because there's always that. And again, the adjustment of just having to think about and wrap your head around just having super large expenses every month can be intimidating. So there's that adjustment and anticipation. I think surrounding yourself with people that perhaps have experience of running a retreat center um, so they can kind of advise. I think we're going to learn while we're in it, but I think being set up to know it's probably going to cost more than I realize 
it's a whole other business um, that I have to adjust to if you don't have that experience. You really need the proper staff. And I will say people with experience, not enthusiasm, a lot of people get attracted to the retreat life. Um, managing a retreat center is very different than you know, having the experience of it. So that was a really kind of a big takeaway for me too. Um, being really, uh, you know, having, I think systems and structures in terms of time and output are going to be super important too. Um, diversification of offerings and give yourself time to really allow yourself to build the business. And I think that's true with whether it's a retreat business or for me, I've had the coaching experience too. And some of the work that I do with clients as well is we don't always give ourselves that room to grow into a business. It is not going to happen overnight. So we have to be prepared for that. I think, I think also I will say the mental and emotional resiliency when you're taking on something really big is, is key. Um, having your support systems, you know, I have a mentor in place that was really helpful when I was having times where it was really hard. And I will say my first year, I wanted to quit and threatened to quit on myself so many times because I didn't think I was cut out for it because it felt really, really hard. And I think where things got a little bit easier was when I gave myself a break and realized there is going to be a learning curve here and I have to go through this. And um, that's part of the process. So you're going to learn, you're going to make mistakes. Um, some of them are going to be expensive mistakes. That's normal. As best as you can, surround yourself with people with experience that can sort of support you. And I think have the mental resiliency to know it might get tough. I think the first couple of years is always, I think a bit stressful because it's taking so much of ourselves to build the business, I think energy wise and expense wise. Um, but we have to be able to see those places through to get to where, you know, it starts to become a little bit easier. Um, pre COVID, this was going to be my most profitable year um, in my business. And I did grow my retreat business is a six figure business. Um, I'm not consistently profitable each month in that business, but I was going to be this year. So it took probably about four years for me to get to the place where there was profitability in, in the business. Um, and uh, that it felt a little bit, you know, I kind of felt my rhythm. So I had to get through those stretches where it felt really hard and I was figuring things out um, for it to kind of work. And we have to anticipate that again. So I recommend, you know, I think going into an endeavor like this is, you know, being able to apply for different loans or having supporters. Um, I think diversification in your business to give room and anticipate that it's going to take a while. You're not going to fill your retreat center right off the bat. Um, I, I was new to the area. I had to build up a reputation. I still find people will tell me they have no idea I exist. So there's a consistency of building up that visibility and sharing that we're here that then, um, or that, you know, you're in your place that helps kind of fill your retreat center. Um, so, you know, those are some of the things to consider. You have to, I think, know both the, um, again, how much things cost. So having an idea financially what this is going to be, um, the time in which things are going to grow, having the right people. And I think for, I would say the biggest thing for myself too, that was like really huge was more of the, I think, a mental and emotional, emotional state that because I came in very naive, um, when things started to feel really hard, I was really hard on myself and that made my process a lot harder. So I think towards the end of my first year, I kind of had to cut myself some slack um, and not see myself as a failure and, and really remind myself again. And this is where the purpose thing comes um, is really important because if I didn't have that sense of purpose, there's moments where I'm like, why am I doing this? You know, why am I stressing myself out? Why am I putting myself through living paycheck to, to paycheck? And sometimes, you know, even less than that, um, for what for? And so for me, that anchor to purpose made all the difference and reminding myself, this is what this place is symbolic of gave me, I think the endurance to go through things, having space for myself to give um, compassion for the learning curve, having space, you know, so my first year I worked really, really hard and it, 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 it almost killed me. Literally. I got trampled by one of my horses. My adrenals went into fatigue. I didn't take care of myself very well. And my mental state was, was emotional state was not great. So having those support systems mentally and emotionally, and again, the, the knowing and embracing that this is going to be hard and there's going to be a lot to this, um, really helped shift some of my mindset that helped it not 
feel so painful. And I will say it was, this has been one of the most difficult things I've ever taken on in my life. And I knew that it was going to be that way. And it stretched me beyond anything that I ever thought I was capable of and that I've ever experienced. Um, I think people still look at what I've taken on and think I'm totally insane. It doesn't feel, it doesn't feel that big and that much now, you know, where I am four and a half years later, because I found my rhythm and I've basically um, acclimatized to the capacity of what I'm holding. So there is sort of an acclimatization period as well um, that kind of goes into that. So what we tend to in ourselves that are the holders of these things, you know, we tend to maybe sometimes look at the business and financial pieces, but our mental and emotional states and how we support ourselves and how we hold space for ourselves is equally important um, to kind of go through um, as well. I think I've written blog posts on my website for every year of the ranch that I can kind of pop in here um, for you guys to go through in the link if you want to see that. So you can just sort of read some of my reflections of what was the biggest takeaway. But I think, you know, kind of wanting to get up and share this was um, I'm all for being a big dreamer because I'm, I'm that way. And when I was speaking to this woman, I said, I don't want to, um, you know, caution you about going for something that feels impactful for you. But I want to offer sort of that wisdom that I maybe wish I would have had when I first started on some of the pieces that I talked about today about, you know, the financial piece about the emotional and the, and the mental um, support. And, you know, having the right people that are supporting you off the bat and, and knowing that it's worth it. I don't regret it. And I have people have asked me that over the years of like, would you do it again? And I said, I would do it again. Um, I might've been a little bit more prepared for some of the, the um, anguish and, and the hardness of taking on something like this. But at the end of the day, um, I've had some incredible moments of people walking away from this place and sharing how special it is or women returning every year for retreat, um, being able to rescue more horses. So my herd is at 28 right now. And when I moved here, I had eight. So I've been able to have an impact, you know, in the places that I've wanted to have an impact. Um, I want to share sort of one other piece of this too, because I think this is just an important piece. Um, when I first bought this retreat center, I sort of was looking at any way that I could monetize the space to begin with, I would do that. And that was important to kind of get to a place where I could pay the bills. And then, you know, something happened last year where I was not really loving my space anymore because I was hosting weddings and bachelor parties and different kind of events. And it was kind of creating a little bit of problems with my neighbors because, um, of the noise. And also I didn't really like people coming here and partying either. It just kind of felt like a violation of what the space was for. And so it kind of got to that point where I also didn't want to sacrifice and do things just for the monetary. So there was sort of a balance of, I had to learn that and kind of go through that of what feels really important to have in my space. And so my adjustment with sort of my business model and my plan is that I would really like to grow experiences that are purposeful, whether it's my own training and coaching programs or other retreat rentals, I'm phasing out and transitioning out of doing, you know, hosting for weddings and different things like that. Um, there is going to be a transition period because we need to do that for our business. I can't just drop an aspect of my business. So there's a bridging period that I think that we also have to give light and space for is that we're going to have to bridge. You know, there's going to be a bridging of we might have to do things that maybe we don't love to do for the experience of it that helps us really clarify what we do want to do. The value for me of the purpose of what this place was for was something I realized that's a really, really important thing for me to empower in this place and that I can support myself financially doing really purposeful things. So that's where I'm emerging out of. And then I think that there's a, symb a symbolism of this place wasn't just about, you know, for so everybody who owns their own business knows it's the biggest you know, personal growth development that you could ever go through. It just, it, it tests you on so many, in so many ways. And um, beyond the hardship, you know, whether it was going into debt or having, you know, challenges with staff or, or whatever, if whatever those pieces were, some of the drama, um, fundamentally, it also was really stretching and teaching me things about myself or enhancing my own leadership. And I think that being able to look at a journey that way is really, really important. Um, 
I, I have a client of mine that a couple years ago, I was supporting her purchasing her own retreat center with a partner. And she ended up a couple years after that exiting out of that because she realized it wasn't for her. And I, I'd sent her a message because I saw that and, and it was really an acknowledgement of her of, we step into these big dreams sometimes um, to learn things. And it's not so much about the end result of it, but what we grew through while we were in it. So I think that having that perspective of this is going to teach me something really valuable. And I try to sort of hold reflections when things are hard and I'm feeling really challenged by the different things that are going is what is this teaching me? And that really, I think, helps open up a different perspective and allows me to keep going um, it's a roller coaster ride. It's definitely not. Again, I think there's this idea that, oh my God, I own a retreat or wellness center and it must be so peaceful and amazing. And people come here and the energy is amazing. And, and it's all of those things. And sometimes it's really hard because to feel um, the burden of, of running a place that requires so much of you can feel overwhelming and daunting at times. So I've, I've adjusted to that. I still have moments where I feel that. And again, what really helps me is going back to the purpose of this place. I'm very fortunate where I've been able to surround myself with some pretty amazing people and different partnerships that has made the world of the difference. Um, but we can anticipate like anything else, things are going to be hard. And when people ask me like, why would you put yourself through it? I think again, the, the core aspect for me is I believe in our capacity as human beings and it's much greater than we um, can anticipate that it is. And to me, a worthy life means I'm stretching those boundaries. Even if sometimes I'm like, why, why do I, why do I do this to myself? It's because it's fulfilling and worthy for me. So the connection to, again, the purpose of this place and the journey of what it represents means that it's worth all of the hard times. Um, it would be much simpler to just have an online business where I didn't have such a high overhead and I probably would have a lot of money as saving in my bank. But I think that my idea of fulfillment and prosperity looks different than that. And I think that I'm on my way to getting to that place and um, I'm okay with sort of holding this sort of space. So we, so we want to think about where our alignment is because we're going to have to come back to that over and over and over again. So um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, what I might sort of offer too, as I, as I kind of share this video is if you're kind of watching this and then you have questions about, you know, what would you say about this or I'm in this part of the process and you want some sort of specific insight, I'm happy to do a part two of this. So if you're watching this and you have questions or inquiries around that, please let me know. Um, and I can kind of deepen, you know, sort of from, from there. So um, prepare yourself that it's going to be hard. Lean into your purpose and make sure it's really aligned. Um, with kind of your core value of what you want to create, surround yourself with people that can be advisors and allies and supporters. Um, be prepared for it to be high overhead financially and to have a sound, you know, kind of business plan idea diversification for that. And mentally and emotionally, um, give yourself room to grow. Know that it's going to be hard. Anticipate that. Uh, have compassion and gentleness for yourself and have a space held for you because that's going to be important. Um, system structures, giving time for a learning curve so that you acclimatize to something new. Um, super, super important. So that's my little wrap up of that. So you want to buy a retreat center. Um, I'm happy to do a part two if you have questions and then kind of leave it at that. For, for more information, if you're sort of in a place where you're in a journey where you're wanting to take a big step towards um, your purpose or your vision or, you know, having a retreat center, part of what I offer in my work is I do um, support and mentor other people in that process. Um, I also have different kinds of resources and courses on my website. You can check it out, hillaryschneider.com, or you can follow me on Facebook, Hillary Schneider, or Women Who Run With Horses. And I'm also on Instagram at Hillary Epona. So if there's places you want to kind of just follow my journey, I am constantly trying to share transparently about things that I'm growing through and offer, you know, different processes and wisdom to those that are on a similar journey. So Thank you for being with me today. I hope that was helpful. And um, I'll maybe see you on a part two.